Well, good morning. Good morning. It is good to see each of you this morning, and uh, Dr. J is, is back in town, and um, he made it back safely, so we're excited about that. Continue to pray uh, for their parents. I know they had an exciting uh, couple of weeks with, with both uh, Dr. J and Ms. Pam's parents, and um, as we mentioned, Wednesday night. Uh, there's still some challenges there, but we can continue to lift them up and, and pray for their continued healing. Um, this morning, as we open our time in God's Word, I invite you to turn to Isaiah chapter 6. And we'll be looking at verses 1 through 7. And I've titled this message, A Sobering Encounter with the Holiness of God. And as we think about what the church needs most today... We may hear people say, oh, we need more programs. We may hear people say, oh, we, we need a better, you know, we need better music, or we need better this or better that, and we need better seats, or whatever the case may be. But what the church needs most today is a renewed view of the holiness of God. Because we have put God in this little box in our Western Christian culture and we've, in essence, limited him in our minds. And it's, and it's evidence, as we see in our culture today, how we're so gripped by fear over different things, politics or the economy or uh, health care scares and things of that nature. God is holy. He is set apart. And as we'll see in this text today, he is firmly seated on his throne. And so the church's greatest need in our culture today is a renewed view of the holiness of God. And and this this section of Scripture, and I'm about to read it, it it begins with an, an astonishing vision of God's holiness. And we'll see why that is. But if you'll turn with me to Isaiah chapter 6, we'll begin in verse 1. And Isaiah writes, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, Holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth, the whole earth is full of His glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of Him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, and Isaiah said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth, and he said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the power of your word. And in this instant, as Isaiah records for us his encounter with you, Lord, help us renew afresh in our mind the the holiness and the greatness of of your presence and your glory. Father, let us not forget that you are on your throne. Father, help us today to see the different facets of this beautiful diamond in Scripture. Lord, we thank you that you have called us to be your children of light 
to be salt and light in this world. We're thankful that you have equipped us with your word that is inerrant and infallible and has power when it is preached and read aloud. Father, we pray for the spread of the gospel. We pray, Father, that from this heightened awareness and vision of the holiness of who you are in your presence, may it change the way we think. May it change the way we live our lives before a lost and dying world. Lord, may it change everything about us. Father, we love you. Thank you for your word, and we ask your blessing on our time this morning. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So number one, we see in this portion of Scripture the dilemma facing Judah. If you're familiar with the history of the kings, you you would know who King Uzziah was. The year was approximately 739 B.C. The place is in Jerusalem, and the death of Uzziah was the event, a turning point in Judah's history and a new chapter in Isaiah's ministry. Uzziah became king at 16 years old. He reigned for 52 years. 2 Chronicles 26, 4 says he did right in God's eyes. So he was a good king. He honored the Lord. He was still a sinful man, but he did what was right. He was good. He did what was right in God's eyes. And during the days of Zechariah, he continued to seek God. Under his reign were military victories, prosperity and commerce, economic stability, and national security. But the pride of his own self-reliance were ultimately his undoing. 2 Chronicles 26 and 16 says, His heart became proud, and he acted corruptly, and he became unfaithful to Yahweh his God. While on a foolhardy undertaking, Uzziah entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense, which you read carefully, that's a big no-no. That was the role of who? The priest, not the king. As Uzziah held the censer of incense, leprosy broke out on his forehead. Uzziah was then cut off from worship. He was a leper until the day of his death. And this was a season of humiliation both for the priesthood and for Judah, the southern tribe. And it was in this uncertain time that Isaiah went to the temple to seek the Lord for strength, for comfort, and direction for the future. Church, we're in these days right now. We need to seek the Lord for direction. We need to seek the Lord for strength and for comfort. For days are uncertain. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We don't know what mandatory thing is going to be placed upon us. But we know that God is on his throne. And it doesn't matter who the president is. It doesn't matter who our governor is. It doesn't matter who is over us because ultimately God is over everything. And if we keep that at the forefront of our minds then we can have a soft pillow in which to lay our heads at night. Amen? God is sovereign over all things. To the greatest of the suns and the planets and the stars, to the most finite atoms and molecules and viruses, there is not a maverick molecule in the universe that does its own bidding. It is all under the sovereign orchestration of God. And if we believe that, And if we hold that in our hearts as being true and we have a high view of God and a high view of his plan for all of creation and the history of redemption, brothers and sisters, this is but a blip on the map. This is insignificant in light of the glory of God and the redemption of humanity. 
And church, this is how God works in our lives. At times, he will bring us to our knees so that we can go before him and be reacquainted with his holiness and with his word. Many times, God uses a dilemma or a calamity to draw us closer to him. There are reports from China where people have been quarantined for Weeks. One lady, I was reading one of her posts the other night, they've been quarantined for 53 days in their apartment complex. Can't leave. Food's delivered to them daily. But what she shared is that her family's grown closer together. Her quiet times have become richer. Her time with her family and her time with the Lord has been heightened because that's all they have. And it's a good testimony to show how busy we have become. And I think it's time for us to take this opportunity and pump the brakes and slow down a little bit. And get back to what is critical and essential in our lives. But God is the nourishment we need. We don't need sports. We don't need all these other other things that, that we tend to hold so dear. But the blessing is, is that God uses these times to draw us closer to him. And that's my prayer, is that the Lord would use this season and the life of the church and the life of creation to show us our great need for him. But can we identify with Isaiah? Have we been through difficult times before that drew us closer? But we know that whatever the case may be, health, family, financial, career-wise, God is going to use all things for our good and for his glory. And we can have confidence in that. We see the dilemma that's facing Judah. Secondly, we see this presentation of God's holiness. The context isn't explicit, but we can assume here that Isaiah had entered the temple, Solomon's temple, to seek the Lord. And he says... I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. The train of his robe, it filled the temple. Above him stood seraphim. They had six wings, two they covered their face, two he covered his feet, two he flew. And one called out to the other saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And so what transpired in this moment was a life-altering vision of God's holiness. Isaiah saw the Lord like he had never seen him before. He saw God to be greater than he ever imagined. It was this account where Isaiah came face to face with the majestic holiness of God. And in this account, he says that he he saw the Lord. He encountered the Lord. He, He had a vision. And we see the transcendence of the Lord. It says, I saw the Lord, Adonai, it's his title, his position, lofty, he's sitting on a throne, lofty, exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. And so in the year of King Uzziah's death, Isaiah was permitted to see the true king of Israel. As I said, the name or the title of God in verse 1 is Adonai, which translates to mean Lord or Master. It carries the idea of one being a sovereign ruler. And so when Uzziah had passed and he is out of the picture, God is reassuring Isaiah that he is still in control. What's interesting, too, to see the transcendence of the Lord says that he was sitting on a throne. And so Isaiah saw the throne of heaven not empty, but occupied. And when he sat on a throne, that means that he was, that when a king sits on a throne, that means he is in control, he is in power. He's not laying in the bed, he's not in the bathroom, he's not asleep, he's on the throne. Now it may have felt like the throne was vacant, but the Lord reassures Isaiah that God is still in control. Positionally, God is actively reigning and sovereignly ruling over all things. 
Psalm 103, 19, it says, The Lord has established his throne where? In the heavens. In his sovereignty rules over all. That's Psalm 103, verse 19. Isaiah also saw God's throne lofty and exalted or lifted. And what Isaiah sees is God's elevated, God being elevated above all rule and, and, and power, both in heaven and on earth. It tells us that God is the most excellent, the most preeminent, meaning he has first place. And he bows to no one. And he rules over all kings, kingdoms, powers, and authorities. This this description of God reaffirms the points made in in chapters 2. Chapter 2. That God is and will be high and exalted. And that man must humble himself before God. And as Isaiah, we read in the text, as he gazes upon the Lord, he can't help but notice what's filling the room. Right? If the room is filled with something, we're going to notice that. It says the train of his robe was filling the temple. And as we think about this panoramic picture of God's splendor and eternal majesty, Isaiah is getting all of his senses filled with the glory of God. In antiquity, in old times, the king's greatness was measured by the size of his royal robe, how long it was, the embroidery on it, how, how beautiful it appeared to be. Psalm 93, 1 says, The Lord reigns. And he's clothed with majesty. The Lord has clothed and girded himself with strength. Indeed, the world is firmly established. It will not be moved. I I love the application there, right? The the Lord is clothed and the world is firmly established. God's in control. Nothing's going to be moved apart from him moving it or him allowing it to be moved. In Psalm 104, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with what? Splendor and majesty. And through these verses, they don't mention a robe. Though these verses don't mention a robe, they testify that God is is clothed. And we see the fact that this this is a picture of his splendor. This is a picture of his greatness. It, 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 it paints a picture that would, that would strike terror in the hearts of anyone who would come in contact with this because in a moment you notice that you're not in control anymore. You notice that you're on the bottom rung of the totem pole. You are nowhere near where you thought you should be. And as I read this, I almost feel as if Isaiah had come a little too close to God. Now we understand what happened with Moses, right? Moses is asking the Lord in Mount Horeb, saying, I want to see your glory. And God says, no. For in the day that you see my glory, you will die. You're not going to survive this. But Moses is persistent. And he asks to see the glory of Yahweh. And the Lord hides him in the cleft of the rock and passes by him and Moses sees the backside of his glory. And even that image of the backside of God's glory changed Moses, not just on the inside, but even externally as his face began to glow. And he had to veil himself from the people at the bottom of the mountain because he was scaring them because he had turned into a human glow stick. He had a Shekinah sunburn that would not go away. But it's true. He came into the presence of God and he left a different man. The same is true with Isaiah. And he's enthralled with this vision of God. As he sees above the throne, it's a sight that's beyond extraordinary. 
I mean, I've been to national parks. I've seen natural wonders and, and, and been to places around the world that just it just marvel at what man has done and what God has created. But what's on earth is just a finite fraction of the glory and splendor of God. We see this too in verse 2. Um, the attendant surrounding a throne. The throne. It says, Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. Two they covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And so Isaiah sees the God of heaven is, is being attended by this angelic court. And these seraphim were a unique type of angelic beings. As they would participate in the worship of God. And the word seraphim translates to mean burning ones. Ones who were aflame. Now there's no telling how many seraphim were, were situated above and around the throne of God. But their purpose was to actively worship God with an intense zeal and, and fervor. It's possible that these seraphs have some connection to the cherubim in Ezekiel's two visions of God's glory. And it's like the cherubim in Ezekiel, the seraphs have hands and faces and feet and wings. But in contrast to what we see in Isaiah, each of these living creatures in Ezekiel 1 had four faces and they were located under the throne of God in order to move it from place to place. That's an interesting vision. Like if you ever want to just have your mind blown about what Ezekiel saw, read that as wheels are turning and things are moving and the God's throne is moving from place to place. It's, it's fascinating. And Ezekiel's immediate reaction to seeing the glory of God was flat on his face. I fell on my face like a dead man. Because he knew there was something different about being in God's presence. Now, I love how the Bible interconnects. And we see in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel says, I kept looking until the thrones were set up and the ancients of days took his seat and his vesture was like white snow, and the hair on his head was like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames. Its wheels were a burning fire. A river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him, and myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court sat, and the books were open. This is the end time prophecy. This is what Daniel is seeing in the throne room of heaven. Myriads upon myriads, thousands upon thousands. Isaiah doesn't quite quantify it. He just says they were, they were seraphim. And, and they were calling out to one another. But what's more important than anything else is not what they did with their wings, but really the words that they spoke. It says they had six wings. It says with the first two wings they used to cover their face. Why would angels need to cover their face? Why would they do that? Because they're part of the created order, right? And to look at the, the unshielded, if you will, glory of God, they would not be able to withstand looking at Him, even as being sinless. God is too pure, too holy. Even the angels which He created that are sinless, still can't gaze upon him. With the other set of wings, they covered their feet. You remember what Moses, what God said to Moses when he approached the burning bush, take off your sandals. For what? This is sacred. This is holy ground. And so these seraphim would cover their feet and with the other two wings they used for flight. Now, verse 3, this is the significance of the seraphim song. And one called out to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So the most important thing about these creatures is not their appearance or the purpose that their wings were used for, but really for their declaration to each other. 
as they would declare, holy, holy, holy. The Hebrew word for holy is kadosh. And, and that, that word carries such weight. And whenever you see it in a triplet or in words back to back to back, it, it shows the, just this unmitigated holiness of God. Like it, it, it can't be altered. It can't be changed. It's perfect. It's secure. It's also in reference, one commentator said, it's in reference to the Trinity, which we don't see that in the text, but if we think about it, it does make sense. But this was their song over and over and over, and it is today their song and will ever be their song for the rest of history. And these seraphim were created to offer ceaseless praise to their creator. Exodus 15, I love the song of Moses. Right after they're delivered from Egypt. He says, who is like you among the gods, O Yahweh? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in praises, working wonders? Moses had a right view of God. In that moment, Thomas Watson, old Puritan, he said, holiness is the most sparkling jewel of his crown. Sam Storms, a contemporary theologian, he says, the holiness of God only secondarily refers to his moral purity, his righteousness of character. It primarily points to his infinite otherness. To say that God is holy is to say that he is transcendently separate, meaning he is, he is above. Holiness is not one attribute among the many. It's not like grace or power or knowledge or wrath. Everything about God is holy. Each attribute partakes of divine holiness. Jerry Bridges, whom I'm sure you've heard of, holiness is the perfection of all of God's other attributes. His power is holy power. His mercy is holy mercy. His wisdom is holy wisdom. It is his holiness more than any other attribute that makes him worthy of our praise. And we see that the angels are saying what? Holy, holy, holy. And it's the repetition it's a literary device used in Hebrew that expresses the, this incomparable, incomparable idea that God is, is holy, holier, holiest. He's holier than anything or anyone. He's the holiest thing there is, period. Amen? As Isaiah was about to enter this prophetic office, as we see in verse 8, he's about to go. He's about to be commissioned for anyone who enters any sort of vocational ministry or if if anyone's about to serve as, as a deacon or an elder or a pastor or teach a Sunday school class or have any sort of leadership responsibility, even be baptized, we need to have a heightened awareness of his greatness. Why are we doing this? Why are we meeting today? Are we meeting to come and to sing just for the sake of singing? No. We come to sing because He is worthy. He is holy. We come to fellowship because God is at the is to be the core of everything that we are and who we are as His creation. And as believers, we partake in that holiness. For we are to be what? Holy as He is holy. Don't want to bust your bubble, but I find that kind of hard to do. And it's called sanctification. As God is making us more and more into His image. And so if we desire to be useful in our service to God, we must have, you and I must have a heightened awareness of His greatness. And like Isaiah Every day we need to encounter the living God. And we can encounter Him through His Word. 
The reason we need to encounter and to grow in our knowledge of God is so that we can be more effective to our service of Him. I love this quote. Those who are most mightily used by God are those who are growing to see the awesomeness of their God. And that's what we need to do as the church is grow to see the greatness of who God is. Now, I love breaking down Scripture because it just fascinates me, but we see the commotion in Yahweh's presence in verse 4. With God's holiness on display, we see this concussive power of the seraphim song that causes the the foundations of the temple to, to shake. And these foundations of this heavenly temple were were shaking as if an earthquake were occurring. Rachel and I had the opportunity to live in, I lived in California for three years, and we were, of those three years, we were married for one of those. Um, Technically, we never lived in the same state until we got married, and so uh, everything was long distance. But after we got married one night, we were, it been a long day, we were laying in bed, and all of a sudden, the apartment we were living in started shaking. And... I just kind of sat up. I was like, whoa. It only lasted about six seconds, but it was enough to get our attention. And the fountain, we were on the bottom floor of like a four-story apartment. So I'm thinking somebody's bed and other stuff's going to come through our ceiling. But you don't realize how not in control you are until you're in the middle of an earthquake. There's nothing you can do to stop it. Car alarms going on outside, going off outside. Everything's crazy. Afterwards, you're like, what was that about? But we see here in the text that it's the song of the seraph that are making the foundations of the temple shake. Now, you ever been to Israel? You ever seen the foundation of the temple? It's solid rock. Like the entire earth would need to be moving for that thing to start shifting around. And this is what he was experiencing in this vision. And and we see not just this violent shaking, but also smoke began to fill the temple. Now what I find interesting about smoke or cloud is it's it's a manifestation of God's presence. In Exodus 19.18 it says, Mount Sinai was all in, in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked violently. This is not new language for us in the Old Testament. This is reasserting who God is from where he has revealed himself previously in Exodus and other parts of Scripture. In the wilderness in Exodus 13, 21, the Lord was going before them in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them on the way, and a pillar of fire by night to give them light that they might travel by day and by night. In the New Testament, the transfiguration of Jesus in Luke 9 says, while he was saying this, a cloud formed and began to overshadow them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. Then a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my son, my chosen one, listen to him. And so whenever smoke or a cloud would fill any given area, that was, that was the presence of the Father. That was the presence of God. And he would, he would speak and he would lead and direct his people. And so as smoke began to fill the temple, Isaiah had a heightened awareness of what was taking place. Who's on the throne? You may want to take a guess. That's Jesus. Yeah. Jesus is on the throne The Father begins to fill the temple with smoke. It's like, all right, we need the Spirit. Where's the Holy Spirit in here so we can just round this thing out? But here's the thing. This this caused fear in Isaiah. I know at times we, we sing about coming into the presence of God as it being just a casual thing. This was not casual. This was serious. And this caused Isaiah to have a healthy and holy fear of God. Now fear, we're not talking about being afraid, we're talking about respect. 
I'm talking about reverence. Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Psalm 111, 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, the conclusion when all has been heard is to what? Fear God and to keep His commandments. 1 Peter 1, 17, if you address as Father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time you stay on the earth. 2 Corinthians 7, 1, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves, amen, from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting in holiness, what? The fear of God. Let us not be so content with grace. Let us not become so content with God's mercy that we lose the reverential awe of God, who He is. We're like, oh, we live in the New Testament. Everything's great. Everything's wonderful. You forget about Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira. That's New Testament. They lied against the Holy Spirit, and God killed them both for their sin. And I believe they were saved. And what happened? It caused fear to come about all who were in the community because they did not revere God as to be holy. What does the church need today? A renewed sense of the holiness of God, which causes us to have a holy, reverential fear of God. Not that we're paralyzed, but we're, we're set free to revere Him and to honor Him in the way that He has called us to. Fourthly, we see Isaiah's anguish within the presence of God. And as Isaiah is is, is witness to this glorious scene before him. He becomes painfully aware of his both his personal sins and the sins of the nation. Now if you go back to chapter 5, and I encourage you to do this later, read how many times he says, woe is you or woe to you. And mark them. Or just write them down. How many times he says that? And I'd say go all the way back to chapter 1 and read how many times he says that. He's bringing judgment on the nation of Judah. He's bringing judgment. He's saying, what are you who do these things? But now he's standing before God. And he says, woe is me. For I am lost. I am ruined. I am undone. Because why? I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen Yahweh of hosts. So Isaiah has been fully exposed to the holiness of God. And his sin is now fully exposed before the light, the Shekinah light of God's glory. And he is convicted over his sins. One commentator wrote, he said, such confrontation Cannot, cannot help but produce despair. For the finite, the mortal, the incomplete, and the fallible to encounter the infinite, the eternal, self-consistent, and the infallible is to know the futility and the hopelessness of one's existence. When we compare ourselves to the holiness and the glory of God, we are, Scripture calls us grasshoppers of the field. We are, we are nothing before him. But God in his mercy has chosen to elevate us and to give us his son and to bestow on us salvation and to be called what? Children. No longer grasshoppers, but children. But when we come before God, we need to see ourselves as grasshoppers. We need to see ourselves as small and finite. And then go back to the promises and realize, I cannot make this myself. That's why we're not saved by works. We're saved by, ultimately, the works of Christ. Because His perfect righteousness is then imputed to our account so that we can stand before God and live. And so as the church, we're the ecclesia, we are the called out ones. We're the ones who have been called out of darkness and into his marvelous light to proclaim the excellencies 
of Christ who has called us. That's who we are. But as we stand before His presence, we stand before His glory, you can say, woe is me. Because you need to have a confrontation with your sinful heart. To pronounce woe on someone or something means to curse, to judge, or to condemn. As Isaiah beholds the glory of God, he can feel the weight. He can feel the the condemnation that divine justice demands. He can feel that. And at the point of salvation, as you feel that divine weight of condemnation, and you hear the hope of the gospel, or whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved, yes, Lord, I'm coming. The problem in today's culture is we don't know, and people don't really know that they're lost. People haven't felt the divine weight of condemnation. They haven't encountered God and have their sins exposed. You ever open up a door, turn on the light and see cockroaches and them just stand there and look at you? No, they flee. They hate the light. They hate truth. They hate what's about to happen. For us, as believers, when the light of the glory of God is shown upon us, it burns. It burns. There's a gentleman at my previous church. He had melanoma and he had to have these these treatments where his face would, would peel for days and they would have to burn away these cancers. And I'd see him and he just looked horrible. And he'd always say, sometimes when I encounter this burning, I know it's for my good. And in essence, that's what needs to happen to us. We need our sins carterized from us. They need to be burned off. They need to be removed. John Owen said, you had better be killing sin or it will be killing you. It's time to put it to death. And church, it's tough. I'm not going to lie. Some mornings, I'll give you an illustration. Some mornings, I get up early. And I get dressed in the dark. And sometimes I'll show up at a meeting and my collar's flipped up. I got a stain on my shirt. I got a stain on my pants. Something's not right. And I use the excuse, well, I got dressed in the dark. But when I step into the light, all is revealed, right? The same is true with us. We're putting on these vestments thinking, oh, we're doing so great. My works are so good. I'm serving here. I'm doing this. I teach community group, yada, 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 whatever. Have you stepped into the light? Because if you did, you realize that your clothes are tattered. And you got holes and patches and strings hanging out everywhere. And you're not as put together as you think. I'm not as put together as I think. We're good about tricking each other, right? We're good about hiding our sin. Calling like my kids, I'm like, hey, clean up your room. Take all that stuff and shove it under the bed. You really didn't clean. You just hid your sin somewhere else. Right? That's what we do. That's who we are. But isn't it freeing to step into the light and realize, man, I I need to be I need to be washed. I need to be cleansed. I need help. I'll see use the illustration that I I left the house before Rachel could look at me. As I call Rachel Holy Spirit Junior. And as we're in tune with the Holy Spirit, we know. We know when things aren't right. We know if we're not walking in truth. And we need the Spirit. 
In the same way that he who finds a wife finds a good thing. Amen? That's right. And so the light of God's holiness reveals the darkness in our hearts. And Isaiah is excruciatingly aware of his filthy condition before the Lord. That he is a man of unclean lips. That he has a defiled heart and a polluted life. Jesus clarifies this problem in the New Testament. And he says, it's not what enters into the mouth that defiles the man, but what proceeds out of the mouth that defiles the man. Isaiah also understood that he was living among a people who were polluted, who were defiled, and who had unclean lips. This tells us one thing, that no person, except for the Lord Jesus Christ, can stand innocent and blameless before God. We're all guilty. Isaiah says this because he, he says that his eyes have seen Yahweh of hosts, the Lord of hosts. And when he sees the holiness of God, he can't help but notice his own wickedness. He can't help but notice that his clothes, if you will, are tattered. When we see the glorious vision of God... In the scripture, we can then understand the depth of our own corruption and depravity. And we realize that everything else is broken around us. So how do we remedy this? Well, we see it in the text, but confession must be a part of our lives daily. To confess our sins before God is to agree with God about our sins. It is to identify by name our sin before God. It is to state it and to take responsibility for it. And the promise we have in 1 John 1, 9 is that if we confess our sin, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you confess, He will cleanse you. That's a promise from his word. And lastly, we see here Isaiah's purification. And it was in this moment of confession, and and I love this, the order that it comes in, because it's true. As Isaiah has confessed his sin, he then experienced God's mercy and his grace. Now, this would scare me, to be honest. Then one... One of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand. Stop. <laughs> Wait a minute. Am I about to be incinerated? What's going to happen? He had taken this from the altar with tongs. Now, he knew that he was deserving of God's judgment. At this moment, I mean, I, I wouldn't want anybody flying towards me with tongs of burning coals, would you? The Bible's clear for one sin is enough. One sin is enough to deserve an eternal fury of God's justice and wrath. Genesis 2, 7. For the day that you eat this fruit, you will surely, the soul that sins will, the wages of sin is over and over. Ezekiel 18, 4. The soul who sins will die. But instead of incinerating Isaiah, he touched my mouth with it, he said. Behold, the seraphim says, behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. And so this touch was not to incinerate, but to show mercy. God didn't kill Isaiah. But he showed him mercy and grace. And Isaiah understood that what he received here was not something he deserved. We also remember that this was a part of Isaiah's prophetic calling into the ministry. We see in verse 8, I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. And he said, Go and say this to the people. And he gives them the message. But this burning coal being applied to the lips of Isaiah symbolized the the necessity for an atoning sacrifice 
that must be made on behalf of sinners. What was placed on the altar? Animals, right? Animals were placed upon the altar for sacrifice. And this, from the place of sacrifice, was a coal then taken to Isaiah and then applied to his lips. Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And we see that this is how God prepares a people for his own possession. He makes them different. He recreates them. If any man is in Christ, he is a new what? He's a new creation. He's a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things are to come. I said at the beginning, I'll say it again, the most important thing that the church needs today is a renewed vision of God's holiness. I love the word propitiation in, in, in the Bible because it talks about how God, through Christ and his sacrifice on the cross, how his shed blood appeased the wrath of God for my sins. That now God is no longer angry with me because he poured out all his anger and his wrath on his son. And there's none left. But there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Right? No condemnation. If you are positionally in Christ, there's not an ounce, not a speck. There's nothing left of condemnation. For all that has been laid upon Christ on the cross. And how do we know that his work was efficacious? Because three days later, what happened? He did exactly what he said he was going to do, and he rose from the dead. And he was victorious over sin and death. And now, in Christ, we have all that we could ever need. God supplied the very thing that he demanded from us, even when we couldn't provide it. Isaiah didn't go to the altar and get that coal. Someone brought it to him. Another great picture of the gospel. We bring these truths to others. And so church, be encouraged today. There's nothing in this created order that can touch you, that can harm you, apart from God allowing it. I encourage you to read Job. This virus doesn't hold a candle to what happened to Job. And read how he persevered. Read how he endured. And I guarantee you'll find encouragement there. Let's pray together.